President of the Senate, Ahmed Lawan, seems to mean business against corruption as he has called for the inclusion of anti-corruption courses in schools curricula to reduce the menace of corruption in the country. He advocated for a review of the basic school curricula to include the teaching of anti-corruption tenets and the ills of corruption in the society. Is this a good idea? What happens? when what they learn doesn't seem to align with what reality shows them. Joining me to the scores, it's all rather still with me in the studio, is Lulu Elegbe. Thank you very much for staying with us. What is the merit of this suggestion in your opinion? Honestly, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because I'm not, when you say teaching um, anti-corruption in schools, and I'm, I'm assuming they're talking about schools from primary school all the way yes. all the way to the top. Now, first of all, I think it should be clear that people already know corruption is bad, right? Maybe kids need to have certain conversations, but when you when you when you're talking about anti-corruption curriculum in say universities, for example, or maybe even secondary schools or A levels, whatever it is. I'm not quite sure what the merit of that would be at that point. To but be you do see some merit for the younger. Yes, general. because they're, they're in terms of formative years. Yes. The then the question then becomes, if they're doing that, if you're teaching them that from primary school, uh, maybe early secondary school as well, does that translate into adults that have the mindset that? anti-corruption is this thing that is this horrible thing that we must never go into that would be possible if corruption hadn't eaten so deep into the society in Nigeria because it's one thing to tell someone corruption is bad is another thing for them to see it in in pretty much every area of life in Nigeria and I so think that's that's what my worry about so it's not so for me it's not it's a good idea don't get me wrong it is a good idea but I think the, my issue is what the, <clears throat> is what the effectiveness of will it would be. be. Well, well, let's look at the, you mentioned the primary, the formative years. So mm. basically, I mean, psychologists have said uh, mm. that children are formed between zero and eight years. Their personality yeah. become, that's still debatable, of course. But mm. shouldn't we give it some real thoughts, you know? At that level, even if we don't get to the other levels, mm. we put those ideas no, I agree. And the young ones. I agree with that because, I mean, even if you take away a school, if you look within a home, right, you bring up your children based on your ideas of what right and wrong are. You teach them this is good, this is bad. So you're bringing them up to have a clear understanding of good, a clear understanding of bad and the consequences of bad. <coughs> Excuse me. And what, and what that does um, to you as an individual, to the family, to the, to the wider society as well. So... Regardless of what happens on the outside, you need to teach them those lessons anyway. And I think that should include, yes, it should include anti-corruption. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is why I said I think it's a good idea. But my issue is the effectiveness of it. And when I say effectiveness of it, it's about the fact that where we are is about where we are as a society today. Because if you're teaching anti-corruption and you're doing, and this is happening, these kids then become adults. I mean, if, you, if, if what you're looking at is a generational, uh, a, maybe a generational shift, that, okay, let's start having this conversation from the younger one. It, it, if you really believe that, or if you're really trying to fight corruption or find the, fight the mindset of corruption, then you should be doing that from that angle and you, do, you should also be taking certain steps to eliminate it in the society as well. Because by the time those kids grow up, if, they're, if someone that has learned all his life that, anti, um, that corruption is this evil thing, is this bad thing, you shouldn't do X, Y, Z, he comes out into the society and all he sees around him or her is corruption here, corruption Yeah, but that's, 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 that, that's the, the essence of forming personality. But I, I think uh, the, the, we should be, um, you, you talked about the larger society, mm. but we also have people who are supposed to be role models. We're looking mm. at the formative age for this yeah. um, conversation now. Teachers who are supposed to do this. We know for a fact mm. that we don't have a lot of, it's not that they don't exist. We just don't have enough morally 
upright and ethical teachers in this country to drive whatever can because i mean if you want to teach anti-corruption tenets mm. to children somebody has to embody that yeah. kind of lifestyle so yeah. my question now would be is it possible for teachers that are grown and set in their ways to learn moral values is it possible at all because if we can get the teachers to make the shift mm. then there might be some hope yeah but the the problem i think my it's easier to teach anti-corruption to kids who don't who haven't formed a certain mindset yet now the problem like you mentioned is that the person teaching them probably has his own mindset about what corruption is and what it well everybody knows it's bad but it's it's about I'm trying to find the right words because if a, a teacher that, for example, is involved in some level, no matter how little, of corruption, he's having that conversation with the kids. You can't do X, Y, Z for whatever reason, and because this is this is what this is what it is. Those kids are listening because that's their teacher. They're not listening. They're not necessarily listening because they have enough of an understanding that's, 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 of that. That's yes. actually my question. The teachers, mm. is it possible for these teachers, mm. um, I mean, we have to yeah, start somewhere, for them to learn some sort of value, is it possible at all? Yeah, but this might, <laughs> this might sound controversial, but I don't believe that because of where we are today, ideally, the ideal thing should be, it's someone who is morally upright that should be teaching these lessons. But because of where we are as a society today, I don't believe it's practical to find, for you to say that um, before you teach this anti-corruption lesson, you yourself has to have, you have to have shown moral uprightness. I'm not saying there are no morally upright people in Nigeria. I'm just saying that being able to find teachers across the board who can say, um, I'm not in, I've not done anything corrupt. I don't do anything corrupt. I'm morally upright so I can teach the lesson. I think it's a bit of a stretch. So my point is that we can't, if what we're trying to do is to teach these children that um, corruption is X, Y, Z, then I don't think if we're going to wait for morally upright teachers, we're going to be waiting for a long time. So I think it's possible, it's, it might sound hypocritical, but I think it's possible for someone who doesn't necessarily have that particular value to still teach that lesson. And because it's not like they, it's not like the teachers don't know that these things are not are not right. It's not like they don't know because you're teaching the lesson, you're teaching the lesson saying um, don't get involved in corruption, blah blah blah, and then tomorrow you want to go and maybe renew your passport, and then you're told that you can't do it. You get it in two days if you pay me um, ten thousand naira extra, and because he's traveling next week. He's not going to want to wait, so he will pay that. So as little as that sounds, it, it is, I don't mean the amount, but as little as that example sounds, it is still corruption at the end of the day. Because what you've just done is you, you're facilitating a corrupt tra transaction by doing what you've just done. So if you're going to find someone who has never done anything like that, in terms of what, what I guess you call it's, moral yeah, For you, it's impossible it's a, at this time. It, it's not impossible, but it's a stretch. It's it, a stretch. It, it, You're just stretch. being nice with what it's a No, stretch. I don't like to say anything is impossible, but okay. it's as close to impossible as you can as find can in Nigeria. Get. Okay, let's, let's look at the curriculum itself. Okay. Yeah, this is not the first time there's been calls for some sort of modification, adjustment. Mm. Some, uh, some educationists have actually said, let's do a complete overhaul mm. of our education uh, curriculum in this country. Yeah. We've had this conversation for years, but doesn't, much doesn't seem to happen with it. Do you see a time when the government will actually take that bold step to review the entire curriculum of... Because some people study things in school that they never get to use. Yes, but I think the review of our curriculum has to do more with bringing it into the 21st century, I think, than specifically corruption. It's, well, it's two things. It's one, teach it, actually teaching Nigerian history, and two, bringing it into this century. Because I, uh, I think it was last year or so, I saw one of the, I, would, uh, I do some things with software in schools. So I was looking at one of the cur uh, curriculum for one of the schools, and I'm not exaggerating, it wasn't that different from when I was in school. And I thought, for God's sake, I'm, I mean, I'm not 100 years old, but <laughs> come on, this thing should have moved on 
by now. Uh, it's, 20, it's 2000, and this was last year, it's 2018. We can't be using the same curriculum that we used 20 years ago. And we, so what kind of students are you expecting to then come out? How do they compete in the, in the global market that we are today? I think if there's going to be a review, it should be something along those lines. Yes, anti-corruption is important, of course. I'm just saying, if they're going to do a review, do a holistic review, and then maybe do a periodic review as well, so that it's always it, it gets constantly updated, and we're not stuck in um, we're not stuck in a decade ago, two decades ago, while the rest of the world is moving on. And I think that's that's probably a bigger problem, in my opinion, than um, trying to think of how to inculcate um, anti-corruption into schools if they were going to do a review. I think bring it into in, into the century. Education is one of the not so well funded uh, sectors in this country. And if you're talking about a curriculum overhaul, that will be, you know, cost intensive. Do you see the government, um, you know, getting behind that, considering the huge financial cost it will be? Well, simple answer is no. Um, <laughs> I mean, even if there wasn't a huge financial cost, I still don't think it would be done because I just don't think education is given the priority that it deserves. Um, it's not, I mean, you look at, and the reason I say that is because, I mean, yes, the, the pre, I've, had, I've seen um, some interviews where the president has talked about the importance of education and all that, but it's one thing to talk about it, but there's this thing they say that puts your money where your mouth is. You can't say education is this important, and then you look at the percentage of the national budget that is allocated to education. And it's a paltry sum in the scheme of things. I can't remember the exact figure, but it's, it's, not a, it's not a huge amount of money. And when you say education is important and then you allocate that kind of money to education, then it doesn't, what you're saying and what you're actually doing, they don't, they don't marry up. So I don't, I don't see them changing anything anytime soon. It would be good if they did. I'm, I'm praying that I'm wrong about that, but I don't see that happening. Any, I, I, just don't see that happening anytime soon. Okay, let's uh, talk about the conversation, that part of the conversation. Sure. It was a meeting between the Senate and EFCC, of course. Yeah. And one of the uh, assurances that the Knight Assembly uh, president said, gave to the um, EFCC, is that they're going to give him, uh, give the commission all the necessary support to fight uh, corruption. What kind of support, in your opinion, would the Senate be able to provide to the EFCC in its fight against corruption? That's a good question. Um, I think uh, that's, that's, that's a question I'd like to ask the Senate president, to be honest, because beyond funding, I'm not quite sure, I mean, I'm not quite sure what support they're looking for from the Senate, because Okay, there's the issue of the, um, the, the fact that the EFCC chairman is still an, quote unquote, an acting chairman because he's never been confirmed by the Senate. So I would think, but has that hampered the EFCC in any way? No. There are people that would argue that he's in that position illegally because he hasn't been confirmed by the Senate. Again, that's a legal debate. Different conversation. But in terms of support from them, I think. EFCC has a budget, right? And I think if the Senate is serious about supporting them and um, getting behind the anti-corruption drive, it's to make sure that EFCC needs, um, gets whatever they need as far, as far as anything the Senate has the power to do. So whatever, is, whatever um, the Senate is empowered to do in terms of getting um, the resources that EFCC needs, then yes, they do need their support. But beyond that, I'm not quite sure um, again, if he's talking about something else, but beyond that, I don't, I don't see, I don't, I don't see it. The anti-corruption fight is it making any headway for you? Um, it, well, it depends. An assessment. Depends okay, let, let's narrow it. <coughs> mm. An assessment from 2015 to mm. now, is it actually making a headway, or the accusations of some sort of lopsided investigation stands? Yeah, but <laughs> So I had this almost this exact argument or debate with a friend not too long ago about um, selective prosecution of or selective investigation of EFCC case, of cases um, at EFCC. And to, to be honest, my, my frank view is that if it's selective, I really don't care that it is. It, do I think it's selective? Yes, I think it is. 
but I don't think it matters. And the reason I say that is because regardless, no matter which government is in power, they, they will be accused of selective investigations by the EFCC. The question isn't the selectiveness. The question is, are the people they are investigating, do they have a case to answer? So if, if there's an APC government there and they're investigating people in PDP, the question, the real question is, those people they are investigating, do they actually have a case to answer? If they don't, then that's a different conversation. But if they do, then why you bother that it's been selective? That's almost like saying uh, Mr. A and Mr. B went to rob someone's house. Mr. A gets caught, goes to court, and you're saying, but um, why are you disturbing Mr. A when Mr. B also, st also stole with him? Which is a fair question, but it doesn't change the fact that Mr. B has a case to answer there. So my point is, that's why, and that's why I say that I don't really mind that it's selective. I just think that the, the, the real issue is that the people that have been investigated, do they have something to be invested to? Do they have something worth investigating? If they do, then I really, it really doesn't bother me that it's selective, to be honest. Thank you very much, Lily, for coming much. on the program. Thank you. Right, we'll go on a short break for our PLOS package. And when we come back, I'll be giving you my take. Do stay with us. The United Nations has reiterated its resolve to help Nigeria improve institutions and capacity aimed at transforming the nation. The UN humanitarian coordinator in Nigeria, Edward Callon, made this known in Abuja as the United Nations marked its 74th anniversary and also officially received the rebuilt UN house, which was attacked by Boko Haram on the 26th of August 2011. I am delighted to welcome you all on behalf of my colleagues to the commemoration of the 74th years year of the United Nations and the official handover after reconstruction and rehabilitation of the UN House by the federal government of Nigeria. The United Nations system has been working with the government and people of Nigeria to strengthen capacity and improve institutions, policies, and legal frameworks that will deliver human and socioeconomic development using global best practices and drawing on the comparative advantages of the UN system. I'm always proud to say that the UN as a gatekeeper of international development in Nigeria will remain steadfast in supporting the government to strengthen institutions and do this in tandem with parliament, judiciary bodies and other national stakeholders as well as bilateral and multilateral partners to improve democratic and accountable governance, facilitate inclusive growth and development to eradicate poverty and provide sustainable livelihoods and humanitarian assistance and help provide and protect the weak and vulnerable in the society. 26 August 2011 was first and foremost a cowardly attack on Nigeria and its people but it was also an attack on the values and aspirations that the United Nations seeks to uphold. Peace, freedom, prosperity, tolerance, justice. The then Secretary General described it as an assault on those who devote themselves to helping others. So the opening of UN House today is an act of defiance against such terror. We stand together to say that we will not be cowed by violence. We will continue to support the Nigerian people, fulfill their dreams of a future of prosperity and security. We cannot seek to change a curriculum when those that are to drive it remain asses. For me, the moral dimension of teaching has for a while received little or no meaningful attention among teachers in Nigeria. There is a growing value-free instructional practice between the student and the teacher. A wise scholar once opined that children do not enter the world compassionate, caring, fair, loving and tolerant, nor do these qualities emerge in due course like hair on the body. Rather, 
moral qualities are learned and acquired in the course of lived experiences. Indeed, if there are no models for them, no obvious or even subtle pressure to adopt moral qualities and no opportunity to imitate moral actions, the moral virtues may be missed, perhaps never to be acquired. So away from any talk of anti-corruption curricula, we need to address this. We need to go back and learn from a time when teachers are role models who do not assault innocent wards in their care or engage in sex for grades and definitely not help them cheat their way to academic success. When we get this right, everything else, in my opinion, will only be a matter of time. And that's a wrap on the program tonight. Thanks for your time. It is appreciated. Please share your comments and observations via our social media handles at Plus TV Africa. Until next time, please, as always, be well.